It's an absolute privilege to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to say that any of the links or if you want any of the resources or if you want any more information, I will uh, be giving out my email at the end of this so you can um, email me and I'll be sending you a whole pack of all the information and everything I've used to put this together. If anything, just come and have a chat to me afterwards as well. Next slide, please. Me, um, this is me, obviously, before I started doing Movember and before I had a, uh, an intercation with a bleach bottle. Um, as I said, my education, my environmental education journey started with my dissertation in my um, third year of university. I did an environmental consultancy report on the student theatre of um, the Birmingham University. I'm on my gap year, my master's next year is an MSc in sustainability and behavioural change. Uh, like I said, I'm a founder and director of your, your long lost friend. I've got several clients, some theatre clients, where I'm helping them reduce their carbon footprint. I've been writing environmental policy for them uh, recently. And one thing I just want to say that I'm still a student. I'm still learning. Um, I'm not an expert in any means. So I, if you have questions, I will try my utmost to answer them. But I might not be able to answer all your questions. But one thing I will promise to you is that if you have a question that I cannot answer, I will go away and look it up for you. Because if I cannot answer it, I'll be extremely interested and will look it up as well. Next slide, please. So my intention for this talk today, stimulate your curiosity and inspire you to action. So I'm sure you're all heard of environmental news. I'm sure you get it with your cornflakes every morning. It ha you get it every to wear. It seems like in every news report you can't get away from it, especially as we're just finishing COP26 this Friday. So some of you might be curious about what you can do individually, and I want to drive that curiosity further and push you to become climate conscious drive you to action, and these actions may be small, these actions might make you think differently, sometimes it's inaction, and it's action to share your knowledge, to share what you learn here today as well. Next slide, please. So, the, the title of my talk is Understanding Your Carbon Footprint. So, this slide is about where did the term the uh, carbon footprint come from? So, a carbon footprint is the total greenhouse gas emissions caused by an individual, event, organisation, service, place or product expressed as a carbon dioxide equivalent. But when did this uh, term first come into our lexicon? And we can all thank this oil giant here, BP. So, um, they popularised the term carbon footprint in the early aughts uh, as they unveiled their first carbon footprint calculator in 2004 so you, the individual, could check your own carbon footprint. Um, this shifted the blame from these 100 companies responsible for 71% of global emissions onto us as individuals. Um, and is a big PR stunt to take the, the shift the blame from them onto us. And it has been said it's been one of the most successful deceptive PR campaigns ever. And because the sentiment's not wrong. We consume the energy, we consume their products, but if we need to change, this change needs to come from these 100 companies because they're responsible for the systemic change if we're actually going to move in the correct direction. I'm not going to stand here and say that if you make a couple of changes in your life, it's going to have a huge impact. If we all do it collectively as a room, it will have an impact, but it's not going to be the systemic change that we need. Next slide, please. So, just going to do some of the background science, we're all on the same level. Greenhouse gas effect, I'm sure you all heard of it. So, energy comes from the sun's earth, hits our planet, and um, if we didn't have the greenhouse gas, or as I refer to it as a blanket, some people call it the Goldilocks blanket because it keeps our planet not too hot or not too cold. Because um, earth with it is about 15 degrees, but without the carbon greenhouse gas blanket that we have, we'd be at minus 17.8 degrees and <coughs> average. So it is really important, but what the greenhouse effect is, is the blanket around the earth is getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And that is what we're trying to combat. Next slide, please. Okay, so greenhouse gases, you've probably heard of this, what the greenhouse gases and what they actually are. So, the, what the big one, as we've all heard of, is carbon dioxide. Um, and this is in transport, through combustion, all our cars, agriculture from plowing the land, deforestation each time we take down a tree, there's a huge carbon bomb that goes off. 
uh, coal-fired power station, natural gas combustion, you heard of it. So that's the big one, that's the big famous one. Methane, as you can see, we've got a lovely cow there, so you can probably tell that methane comes from livestock, from um, their gases. It also comes from landfill, from decomposition, fracking, natural gas combustion. Nitrous oxide comes from nitrogen fertilizers we put into the soil um, when through farming. And that's really harmful because it gets into our water system and into our rivers, and our rivers get overly nitrated. CFCs and HFCs, this is another big one uh, to do with the ozone. It's used in aerosols, blowing agents of foam, uh, packaging materials, all these kind of stuff, but they are being phased out due to its ozone completion. There you can still see them in some refrigerators and this kind of stuff, but it has, their use of it has really gone down. Last one is sulfur hexafluoride, excellent electrical conductor and extremely potent greenhouse gas used in electrical insulation, and more than 10,000 tons of it is produced per year. Okay, so these um, scales we've got at the bottom here is how long when it's produced is its time in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide, 100 years, and then we go up to 3,000, 2,000, uh, 3,200 3, years with sulfur hexafluoride. So for all of them, they're in the atmosphere for a really long time, and that's the really big problem. So I said earlier carbon dioxide equivalent, and that's what this is. So all of our pollutions are measured in carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2e. And what that means is the sum of all the greenhouse gases, so um, a polluter would be do more than one of these, but it's the collection of all of these together using carbon dioxide as um, an index. So methane is 72% more potent than carbon dioxide. And then we've got uh, sulfur hexafluoride, the most potent, is 16,300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And uh, that, so that's what carbon dioxide equivalent is, and you probably heard of it, and that's it. Next slide, please. The history of carbon uh, atmosphere, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, sorry. So, as we can see, uh, this is years before present day, it, the graph starts just after, just before 800 years, and it's how much parts per million carbon dioxide is in our atmosphere, and we've had fluctuations, we've always been fluctuating, and that's due to tiny walls in the Earth's orbit, volcanic eruptions, all these sorts of things. But, as you can see, this little arrow, it says the start of the Industrial Revolution, and then we just go off the scale and we keep going up and up and up, and if, if anything, that line is getting sharper even further in the future. Um, 2021 is on track to be the first year to surpass pre-industrial revolution um, levels by at least 50%. We are right now at 1.2 degrees of warming since pre-industrial levels, and after COP26, if all promises are kept, we can limit warming to 1.8 degrees, but however, if, um, the time after the Paris Agreement has anything to show for it, uh, with people not keeping their promises, uh, we are actually on track for a 2.4 degrees of warming, and that is a really scary statistic. So let's go break it down a little bit further. Um, well, actually, no. We're gonna go to views of climate change. So, uh, a recent survey done in 2021 asking people uh, their views on climate change, 60 and 90% of the uh, citizens reported feeling somewhat or very concerned about the harm they would personally face from the environment. Um, and a Bristol survey of young people's views says that people have failed to care for the environment, 80% uh, of young people agreed with that, and four out of 10 children um, are hesitant, four out of 10 young people are hesitant to now have children because of this climate change, which is, uh, again, uh, another harrowing statistic. Next slide, please. So, some key um, examples from the last year and what's actually happening. So this picture here of the wildfires, I'm sure we've all seen them, is this one is 12 people have died in Greece, Turkey, and Italy recently. Uh, 580 fires broke out over seven days. Uh, a scary statistic. This one here is flooding in China. Um, all these cars have been flooded. 30 people have died and 200,000 people had to be evacuated. And a uh, really, really harrowing uh, fact is 12 people died in the metro as water started coming through the gaps whilst they were in the subway. Mm -hmm. um, this one up here is probably, uh, top right is a famous one, is the winter storms in Texas. 
3.5 million businesses and homes were left without power and the temperature was minus 13 degrees in some areas. The total death toll was 210. Uh, bottom right is Cyclone Sujoa in Indonesia where they had landslides and flash floods and 160 people died. So the main thing is that we're seeing records. We're seeing records of um, temperatures in both directions from heat and cold and we're seeing record, record numbers of rainfall as well. The one I did talk about is Storm Kristoff. So this is the one at home as you can probably tell. Um, 18 to 20 percent uh, of, no, from the 18th to the 20th of January was one of the wettest days ever recorded in the North Wales and the North West Wales. Um, big floods everywhere, the biggest flood we've ever seen. So the main thing is that these events, the frequency, because we've always had events like this, and that's an argument, we've always had events like this all throughout history, but the frequency of these events are becoming more and more and more, and it's becoming more dangerous. Um, we are having seen an alarming amount of people being um, climate, um, Im climate immigration, people having to evacuate and move to other countries due to the climate. So uh, it's, it's a really big thing. Okay, moving on. So what can we do? So this is calculating your carbon footprint. So here we have my carbon footprint and we've broken it down into four key areas. So this is the WWF carbon calculator. It's a really good one, quite nice and simple. We have two more examples here, and as we go down, they get slightly more complicated. So for the Henkel one, you have to record all the energy use in your house, and it gets quite, uh, yeah, as I say, complicated. So the WWF one, really good, really easy. You could just sit down and do it. You wouldn't have to measure anything. And, and as you can see, because um, at the time I did this, I was gardening, I was driving everywhere to all of my clients, so my travel is very big. Um, but then my food is quite small because I'm a vegetarian. So uh, carbon calculators are really good because they show you which areas you personally need to focus on the most. Um, okay, so what are the UK average carbon emissions today for each person is 12.7%. Um, so if you click, can you click now? Yes, so there we go, 12.7%. What the world average of carbon emissions, if you click again, is seven. Um, uh, the 2021 target for the UK is where we should all want to get to, is 10.5. And then um, what the, a calculation that if we shared equally with everyone on the planet, the emissions between the whole Earth and the population, um, and within the remits of the Earth's bounds, is one. And Mike Berners-Lee, the, the book I've read to put a lot of this stuff together, said we should all commit to a five-ton lifestyle. Um, and th this is crazy. Um, America's uh, carbon footprint per person is 21. So that's off this scale. Um, but then Malawi is 0.2. So that's when you can really see that that's what actually the world average is. Um, next slide, please. So, on to what we can do. And this is the stuff, this is all the stuff that's in our lives. We certainly have a lot of stuff nowadays. Researching for her film, The Story of Stuff, Annie Levin discovered that of the materials flowing through the consumer economy, only 1% remains in use after six months. Um, and that's, that's a harrowing statistic, that we only keep 1% of things after six months. I'm going to be talking about embedded and embodied emissions. So that means, so if you bought a car, it's the emissions of all the parts in the car, that car itself, what it takes to run that car, and to get that car from the factory to your door. So all those emissions combined. So each item has a huge embodied emissions of what it is, and it can choose a range in a lot of things, and that's what we're talking about. Last bullet point is planned or built obsolescence. So if any of you have got iPhones, you can probably tell that after a while, that iPhone gets really slow. And that's because how they do it is they up, give it an update that um, is too much for that phone. So that phone, then you have to go and buy another one. There was also a big scandal within light bulbs. Um, they were making light bulbs uh, lifespan really short so that it would pop and then you have to go buy another one. So uh, it, it is a thing and uh, the Eurozone and Europe are actually being pretty good at bringing in laws and hopefully we will follow suit to stop this kind of action taking place and they've actually sued um, Apple recently for uh, 
it was some crazy figure of, for about 10 million, but that's just what they make in one day. So it didn't really matter in the end. Um, okay, next slide, please. General solutions are what you can do. So one important thing, turn on ad blockers. Turn on ad blockers on your, your computer and mute adverts on your TV. So when they, they come up. So it's those adverts that are designed to manipulate us into buying things that we probably won't have for a long time don't grab you. Um, and that, that's one thing. Because if you need it, you would have already gone out and get it. These adverts are, they use like casino lottery machines, ideas of how to grab people and how to actually get in our heads to make us buy stuff. Um, uh, ask yourself, will you be using this in six months or plan well it, where it will go after you buy it? I might not use this for six months, but I know that a friend will have it. Or I know that um, uh, I can donate it to a charity shop. Uh, it's it's had knowing where it's going to go before you buy it. Buy quality. It's um, a sh more expensive in the short term, but it's a long term investment, and that's really key. Um, one thing I have to add is novelty Christmas items. So you buy novelty Christmas items, and they're the ones that are and going to end up in the landfill a month after Christmas. Um, so it, it's just buying things for buying sake because that's a, a tradition that we have. Um, support independents and small businesses by local and that reduces the transport it takes for that product to get to your house because it's there. One really bad thing is um, Amazon at the minute and their next day delivery which is an amazing system. I use Amazon for a lot of things. Um, but one thing I have to say is I'm no saint. I came here, I drove here today. I, um, I still eat uh, vegetarian stuff. I still buy stuff on Amazon. But um, their next day delivery is just meaning that they have to transport a lot more. Instead of they do it like well, once or twice a week where they could build up all their parcels and go to deliver everyone on your street, they're just gonna go to your house on the street and then go somewhere else. So the transport emissions of that car is a lot more. Conscious consumers uh, check where it was made, check what products in it, it's eco labels. Here's a couple of the eco labels you've probably seen. Um, good on you is a good ethical branding app for um, clothing. Next slide, please. Food, here's a lovely range of lots of food. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so here is some of the carbon footprints of some of the food that we eat. Um, as we can see, no surprise really, but the red meat are at the top, beef and lamb. And you can see that high impact is way away from everything else. So that high impact one is probably going to be beef from Brazil, uh, built on deforested land and with corn fed kind of thing. So that's going to have the highest impact. But what's really key to see is its range. And so the worst chocolate, again, probably from Brazil, air freighted in, um, on deforest built on deforested land, that kind of stuff is actually worse than the, the best beef you can buy. And that best beef is probably grass fed, probably just, just around the corner, and that stuff is really good to use. Regenerative farming, the farming that we should all be moving towards, actually has cows and sheep in its uh, idea. So we will actually need to eat meat. Um, we, we don't actually all need to go vegetarian, is, is what I'm trying to say. But looking at it, the ones with the lowest ones are obviously tofu, beans and nuts, the, what the vegans eat. So it is the lowest um, impact. Since 2008, meat consumption has gone down by 23%, dairy consumption has gone down by 18%, 15% increase in the range of vegetarian and plant-based ready meals. Um, and I just want to recommend if, if you have sausages and you like the Richmond ones, just try the vegan, uh, well, try the plant based alternatives. A lot of people I've spoken to um, can't taste the difference. So uh, that's one of the best things. Next slide, please. General solutions <laughs> eat less meat and dairy. And by this, I don't mean become vegetarian. I'm not asking you to be, become a vegetarian tomorrow. I'm not asking you to be a vegan tomorrow. I'm asking you one meal a week, replace it with a veggie alternative. Because um, um, it, it's going to take time to build a recipe list of new vegetarian alternatives. So it's like when you have sausages, do something else. I love bolognese. I can now do it with um, a bolognese, a mince alternative, and that's great. So do it one step at a time. And then if you do eat meat and dairy, make sure it's local. Like make, have, make, make it even more of a treat. Go, go to your local farm shop and get a really good cut of beef because that's gonna have the lowest carbon footprint and it's good. Eat everything you buy, learn to love leftovers, 
Uh, I'm in a family of meat eaters still, so I make a big proportion of vegetarian and then I freeze it and then it's lunch for tomorrow. So learn to eat everything you buy or donate it. Um, I'd, there's loads of food banks everywhere. In a supermarket, there's normally a food bank area near the end. You can go and give what you're not gonna have um, by the end. Compost, um, throw your veg ends into your green bin is the easiest thing to do, or if you do have a compost heap or an area for compost heap, just throw it in there. A couple of years, then you can put it on all your flowers. You can have the best garden um, out of all your friends, out of the whole rotary crop. So just uh, maybe it's a good idea to have. Avoid air free freighted food. One key thing about that is if I go on a vegan diet, but all my stuff is air freighted, my diet is worse than when I was a meat eater because because of the um, combined emissions of, of all the planes that brought my food to me. Conscious consumers, uh, reduce the packaging that you have. There's loads of pop-ups. Uh, there's the store in Bedford, which is Bedford's first zero waste shop. There's one in Olney as well, where you bring your jar, uh, and then you, you fill up all of your, your dry goods, your mueslis, um, your, your raisins, uh, even like your shampoos now, all this kind of stuff that you can start refilling what you have instead of all this plastic and all this rubbish that's just going to go into landfill. It's going to be a complete change in your lifestyle. Make, like I say, do it small and do it, um, start doing it slowly with ones or two different things, but um, it will make a big difference. They have one in two minutes. They have one in two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, amazing. Okay. Um, but saying this, next slide please, uh, there's lots of barriers to changing food habits. Like I said, eating with other people. If you're eating with someone who doesn't want to reduce their meat consumption or the dairy consumption, you've got to be wise for that. I now, we now have to cook two meals in the house because of me and my little brother, we're both vegetarians. Um, so eating with other people is hard. New recipes, more ingredients and more time shopping. That's one thing that I say, don't just jump to be a vegetarian because you're not going to have all the recipes that you've built up over time from all your meat stuff. So um, more ingredients, uh, you need a lot more of everything, to be honest. And I'd say it's made me a better cook because you need a lot more. You need to try a lot harder because you're not just relying on the meat for flavor um, and more time shopping. And that's why You've got to build time to build your recipes, but also when you go into the shop, you're not going to know where to go. You've, sometimes you go in and you feel a bit lost because your usual route of the meat and dairy are, you don't do that anymore. There's bits and bobs all around the shopping, uh, all around the supermarket that you're not going to go. Emotional attachment to food. I love a bolognese. I was a steak man. I was a burger man. 100%, uh, that was what I had. And that's why uh, change one of your meals a week that you uh, aren't as emotionally attached to and, and keep those ones that you do really do love. And maybe just swap, switch your red meat to your chicken um, or fish, that's a really good thing. Nutritional concerns, a lot of people come and say to me that I don't have enough protein in my diet because I'm a vegetarian, all this kind of stuff. But you just find different ways, it's really easy and really simple. Um, I eat nuts now, um, uh, a lot of the vegetarian alternatives have the same level of protein. Soy milk is the same as normal milk. Like it just takes a little bit of research and a lot of my pack that I can produce you does the research for you. So it, it's just good like that. All right, on to transport. I know we're a little bit blah, blah, down for time. Lovely boat that I took in Cornwall. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I normally do this talk for about two hours. And there's lots of interactive elements in this, um, and this is one of them. We're not going to do it now because we don't have time, but I ask people, you're, you're going to London to Glasgow and back, which of these mediums of transport do you think has the lowest carbon emissions? So, with the train, plane and coach, you're sharing your um, carbon footprint with everyone because you're on a train with loads of people, you're on a plane in economy with loads of people, and you're a coach with loads of people. But then you're in an SUV on your own, and electric car on your own, and official efficient petrol car all on your own. So which one do you think is the worst and most people will predominantly go, next slide please, will predominantly go to plane but actually because you're sharing with so many people plane is only second. Plane is 368 um, and SUV is the worst. If all the SUVs on the planet were combined um, they would be uh, the seventh biggest polluter in the world if they were a country. Um, we, no, the cars we produce are 50% SUVs and they are, as you can see, one of the most polluting. This is a small efficient 
petrol car, and that is a large SUV, almost five times as bad. Um, there's calls for uh, like a, a tobacco advert ban, you know, like they banned for tobacco. They're now wanting to do that for SUVs as well. So um, that I, when I first learned this, this was a real like uh, smack in the face because I did not know that. Um, and that's crazy. As you can see, coach is the best, train is uh, the second best, and then electric car and small efficient petrol, it's only about 100 in between them. So it, it, it really is eye-opening, and I'm not saying that this is what makes planes very good, it doesn't. Um, try to avoid flying. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so general solutions, ditch the car if you can, uh, only if you can, the benefits of cycling and walking are shown as infographic, helps the NHS more than anything. Um, well-being is good, it's better for local businesses because of the footfall outside their shops, uh, produces air quality, uh, the economy and congestion. So it, it's all amazing. This is a uh, gear change, this is a, um, a recent government initiative to try and get people to stop using their cars and this is a really good infographic. Um, share the journey, uh, carpool, you could carpool to get here today, that would be a really good idea. Um, uh, drive carefully there's actually now eco driving courses that you can do um, that teach you to drive more efficiently which is interesting it's just like the idea that if you drive 55 miles an hour instead of 80 which i know is um illegal but some people still do it you can save a third on your fuel consumption which is uh, it's fascinating to know video conference as i'm sure you're all aware because all of these calls are all over zoom for so long but if you don't need to meet do video conference, if it's, if it's do far travel, and as a theatre background, I understand how good meeting in person is now and how healthy it is and how necessary it is. But if you're having more than one a week, maybe do just have it online, have a video conference. If it's someone so far away from say in Scotland or in Wales, just Zoom them instead of uh, driving to meet them if it's just gonna be a short exchange anyway. And reduce flights. Uh, it, it's awful to hear. I, I love going on holiday. I love visiting all the Europe. But now we're all connected by train. It makes it slightly easier. But just holiday closer to home. 70% of flights are taken by the wealthiest 15% of people. Um, so it's, it's really offset and uh, we need a frequent flyer tax. All right, last one. Home. UK has the oldest and the most inefficient housing stock in the whole of Europe. And um, the money it produces to... Uh, pay for this uh, leaky houses is um, vast. So an E-band energy efficient home costs 920 pounds more annually to run than a C-band level efficiency home. And we should be getting homes in A and B. So there's 920 pounds you can save each year by um, uh, retrofitting your home. Uh, and honestly, uh, poor housing costs the NHS 4.1 billion pounds per year due to more hospital visits, due to poor health, due to excessive cold. HUK recently did a study and one degree drop in cold, GP appointments go up by 19%. So every time it drops. So that's it's a frightening. Uh, what we've got here is knocking down and rebuilding houses to carbon neutrality standard it costs 80 tonnes of CO2, but just refurbishing it costs eight tons. So knocking down our leaky house stock is not the way forward. The best thing is to retrofit. General solutions, instant money and carbon saves. Install a smart meter, uh, which is amazing. Uh, knowing your energy consumption can lower about by 15%. So just knowing it and just having it there and it's free to install. So it is great. Having, um, have shorter showers, treat baths as a treat, have shower baths turning off lights and appliances, including the Wi-Fi when you leave the house kind of thing. Um, only the boil with water necessary in a kettle, I'm really bad. I fill it up and boil it all, but then I don't use half of that boiled water. Um, boil water slowly on a stove is just uh, an easy one. Running machines and dishwashers on the lowest temperature, that still does the job. Um, small costs with long-term savings, switch to LED light bulbs, insulate your loft, Switch to 100% renewable energy providers. That's a really good one to do. Bulb and octopus energy. And it normally sometimes even saves you money by switching to 100% renewable energy provider. Bit smart thermostats to radiators. So that just means uh, when you're in only in a few rooms, you can heat those few rooms instead of heating the whole house. Um, and again, saves a lot of energy. Maintain your boiler and replace it if it's not efficient. 
and if you have a log burn, make sure it is efficient, get an expert to check it, the wood's dry and you're utilising it in an efficient way. Lastly, big changes, ones you've heard of, double or triple glaze your windows, fit solar panels, fit ground or air source heat pumps and insulate external walls. We're going to gloss over that because that's for Bedford and that's not for St. Nits, unfortunately. Thank you so much for listening. Sorry there hasn't been a lot of interactive elements of it because I had to really produce it from two hours to 20 minutes. But I hope that was informative um, and you got a lot from it. Uh, I will, I'll ask Sally could, if we could circulate my email um, on uh, if it sends it to you. So uh, you can just email me and I'll send you the whole pack of loads of links, loads of books, loads of... Um, films and loads of uh, places that you can go to lower your carbon footprint and I've done all the research for you so it's just a click away. So just email me and I'll send it back to you. Um, please come and talk to me afterwards but um, th that's me finished. If we have uh, time for any questions, um, please ask. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. How did you get involved? What got you into this? Yes. So um, I'm actually, like I said, carbon literate. And that means as a qualification that I teach to businesses that they then go and teach the business themselves so everyone in their business become carbon literate. So I'm actually trying to be a trainer for that. Well, I am going to be a trainer for that. I'm designing my own course. And this is practice for me to do that. So it's practice for me teaching the information out. A lot of this will be on the qualification. It's a six hour course. Um, so it is that and I care a lot about the environment. So spreading it as much as I can in my free time is important to me. Um, so thank you very much for the question. <coughs> Any other questions? How do individual countries assess their carbon footprint? How do individual countries assess their carbon footprint? Very good question. So it is a lot of, I think it's the Office for National Statistics. And what they do is they send out a big team uh, to look at all these other things. Where they focus on is they focus on their fossil fuels, obviously. But then it's a lot of different departments working together. So it's the housing department looking at all their stuff. It's the transport department looking at all their stuff. It's looking at all how many coal factories it's have. It's looking at how many um, nuclear factories. So it's a lot of different things coming together. Um, are, you, are you talking about the personal one or, or no, one no, of the whole no, country? No, 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 the yeah. international one. So it's a lot of different places of statistics all combining together. I don't know the complete lowdown for that, I'm sorry, but um, it will be each of those individual sections we looked at, uh, and it will be like each big company that operates in this uh, country will be talking to each other as well. So it will be a collation and amalgamation of all the statistics from all of the different levels. And it's probably not very accurate because there's a lot of places that don't even do that. And that's what I go in and do. I teach people how to use the carbon calculators for their business so um, we can get a better reporting on it, if anything, um, uh, which is important so people know the level they're at so that they can know the level that they have to be or they should be at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, on that particular point, I mean, is it the fact that We've exported a lot of carbon emissions yes. by, by um, yep. not manufacturing in this country, but importing so much stuff. Yes. And how much is that taken into consideration when the government pronounces that we cut our carbon emissions? Or have we really? We've just yeah. handed it over to another country. We are certainly reducing our carbon emissions. We are reducing our carbon emissions. But even the fact that the Cumbria coal mine is being under serious contention, if it's even going to go up, is a, a way of we are actually cutting our carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. But yes, our manufacturing is going elsewhere. I think the Honda garage, because of uh, the Honda factory after Brexit has now left. Um, so even now we're losing big manufacturings, uh, which could say that's, uh, I think, why our uh, carbon footprint's going down. One big thing is our rubbish, even our recycling is going elsewhere. So um, it's been putting landfill sites, which like I said, with the methane is really bad, so that's being transported and that won't be included um, in ours. Um, and uh, our recycling, and as you probably know, our recycling gets taken from here and burned somewhere else, not actually recycled. And in those areas where it is being burned, um, children are getting, well, 
they, uh, there's one documentary I was watching where a girl's nose bleeds every day because of the air quality of burning the plastic like right next to her. So um, I am very sure, and it's probably where I stand politically as well, the government are squandering some things because of how we kind of push carbon footprints on other people just like we push our rubbish on other people as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That was really interesting. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much for having me.